Hey, everybody, it is the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, your host, and uh, I, have a, I have a friend, a new friend here with us today. This is Pastor Trombley. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. How are you, brother? I'm doing really well. I appreciate you taking your time uh, to, to come and join us. So I got to see you on the internet. Uh, you, you sat down with the seminary in Fort Wayne to talk about demon possession um, and uh, exorcism, which are, are they're, they're sort of, they're flashy topics, but they're also, they're real topics and there's they're stuff to say here. Uh, so I was really excited when you agreed to, to come and share with the, with the kids who listen all about the, the, the dark powers that be. So, uh, Pastor, what can you tell me about demon possession and exorcism? <laughs> It's real. And I think that's the first thing to acknowledge is like there is another spiritual, there is a spiritual world out there. And too often in the West, we live as materialists where we think the only thing that exists is what we can feel, see, and touch. But it's real. And it's been a ministry of the church ever since the beginning because it's what our Lord himself was about. <laughs> Right. Like we started the book with a story about stomping on the head of a demon snake. So, <laughs> yeah. no, that's correct. That's right. So, um, the way I like to approach demon possession and exorcism is from the care of the souls, from, from pastoral care. And so, I think that helps because a lot of times, like in Hollywood, like you look at exorcist movies and everything like that. They kind of make it like this big spiritual firework type thing where you get to see the demons act and they portray Satan as having like all this authority and then the poor church can't do anything, you know, and we got to do all these other things rather than it really being about Jesus. And Jesus is the exorcist and he's the one that casts out the demons. I really love what you just said there. And to kind of connect two dots, you said like we, we're materialists and we live with what's in front of us. And like, I was just thinking, as you said that, like we talk about, well, today, if we're going to talk about demon possession, we'd actually talk about cell phone addiction almost the same way. Like you guys, these kids can't get off their phones and you guys, the demons are just taking over everything. And then when you talked about Hollywood, you say you get to see the demons do stuff. Uh, like we actually need the, 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 sort of secondhand confirmation that this is real outside of God's word. Look, a, a kid just vomited something green. Um, but but you actually made this then wonderfully, tr terrifically boring by, by letting us actually just find the comfort and promises of Jesus. Um, talk yeah. to me more about like how exorcism actually looks in, in light of, well, just Jesus. Well, exorcism, the way it's popularly portrayed is like, it's like a 12 round boxing match between the mm -hmm. exorcist and the demon. And so in popular thought, it's like, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to have this fight with this demon. And then it depends upon my holiness, my righteousness and my faith. And if I'm strong enough, then I can get the demon out. And that's totally not what the scriptures talk about. It's actually bringing Jesus into the confrontation with the demon, and it's allowing Jesus to exercise the demon. And so it has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with any exorcist or pastor or Christian. It's all about Jesus. And so if it was just up to like you and me, according to just us as human beings, we'd have no chance to cast out any demons whatsoever. But because we come in the authority of Jesus, which he gives to his church, to all believers, it's his authority that is actually what's operating in an exorcism. So what then does an exorcism look like? And so if you were to break it down into its parts, the exorcism is prayer, and, th and that prayer is just Lord Jesus, please deliver this person from these demons that are afflicting him. Please cast these demons out and please don't let them return. And so that prayer then, however it looks like, because there is no like magical formula, you know, because that's the, the other end, the extreme that people can go into. So you either have the one extreme of it's the, it's the priest or exorcist pastor in his holiness, or you go to the extreme of there's some type of formula that I got to do exactly. And then exorcism becomes like a magical ritual in a way. And so if we focus on prayer and we're just praying to Jesus to ask him to deliver this person, and then you also have 
an example of uh, St. Paul in the book of Acts when he casts the demon out of the girl that is following him. And he just says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And so then you also have where the apostles couldn't cast out a demon. They failed in their exorcism. Mm -hmm. And so right. they're like, Jesus, why did we fail? And he's like, well, these only come out by prayer and fasting. So those are the three things. You have the command in Jesus's name, you have prayer, and then you add fasting to that. And that's what exorcism is. But it's all about Jesus, though. Uh, you, you contrasted it with magic. And, and somebody told me once, magic is always like, no matter what sort of, you know, book or movie or, or real life thing you're talking about, magic is always, how can we manipulate something we can't see to get something we can see? And so it's always sort of like, what can we do to get something? Whereas if you leave this actually in God's will, it's a safer place to be because we, we want exorcism sort of by our sinful nature to be our doing because we don't want the demon there. But then when you get to recognize Jesus doesn't either, and he's better at this than you, um, then, then all of a sudden, and it's like a freeing thing to say to say Christ has already conquered the power of the devil by his death on the cross and he will manifest that victory in your life uh simply by his presence so yeah. I, I guess kind of moving it forward then um how do you how do you know you might need a exorcism well there are there's a lot of signs for demon possession so if we just start out with like looking at the scriptures like when jesus encountered a demon possessed person like what were some of the signs that they had and so you had some of them that were mute some of them that were deaf blind you had episodes where the demon would throw the person on the ground you had the foaming of the mouth then you had extraordinary strength like the, the man that was in the cemetery where they had him chained and he was breaking out of the chains. Then you have also um, uh, knowledge of things that the person shouldn't have knowledge about. And an example of that from the scriptures could be of how the demoniacs identify Jesus as the son of God right. when nobody else knew of that. And then another is the possibility of speaking in another language that they've never had the chance to learn. And so that's not really shown in the scriptures, but that will come in. Like if you just study the, the different cases of demonic possession through the centuries, that's one of the signs that they look for then. And so you also have um, the demons where they like to cuss you know, and also say blasphemous stuff. And so you're not in every demon possession will you have all the signs. So you may have one or two, or they may not manifest at all, you know. And so the good thing of the way we do exorcism is that we're, we're really just praying. And so regardless if I'm seeing or anything or not, I can always pray for somebody. Uh, you you kind of let us leave these things in the extremes where they belong to. Um, so it, it doesn't have to be then every time I, I well, just w woke up and was a sinner, need to be exercised. Um, that's I, that's I, correct. It, that, that's good, right? Yeah, because it isn't like, and, and that's the other problem is that we see Satan behind everything, you know, and he's not behind everything. Though he is real and he does do things. Um not everything is attributed to him, you know? And so then what happens is people start living in fear and then they're totally consumed like with, I got to do spiritual warfare. Satan's attacking me. I can't say my prayers out loud because he'll hear me, you know, just all kinds of crazy stuff that people get led into, you know, but that isn't what Christ came to do is to leave us in bondage to the devil. He, he came to set us free. And so as baptized Christians of God, we are free in Christ. And so they have no authority over us, these demons. And we should not be afraid to pray out loud or to do anything because we have the Holy Spirit residing inside of us. That actually might be the greater work of the devil. He takes the things that God would give for comfort and he would turn them into burdens. Um, and, and yeah, exorcism is not meant to be a burden, but but rather it's a blessing that even if like the most unthinkable, awful things were happening because of the assault of, of the great evil one, the fallen angel, well, Christ is still yours. You are still safe. He will yeah. still conquer the, the enemy. Um, and, and he can leave us with that. And so if, if 
you uh, happen to be a kid and, and this is something like there are dark things out there and you, you feel a little too close to it. What do you do? You pray. You can say the Lord's prayer. Thy kingdom come. What's interesting with that, that petition, thy kingdom come. If you look at Jesus' sending out of the 12, and then you also, if you look at his sending out of the 70, one of the, the evidence that the kingdom has come or is coming to the people they go to is the, the casting out of demons, that the demons are being removed from the people they are hurting. So when you are feeling evil or you're feeling something like that, you can pray thy, the Lord's Prayer and deliver us from evil. You know, so right inside there, in the Lord's Prayer itself, we have a, a prayer for protection and deliverance. And then also you could pray Luther's morning and evening prayers. Yeah. As well. well, and there's, there's, there's one more too that, that we haven't quite gotten to yet, and that's just, you're baptized, right? Your baptism is an exorcism. Uh, it is a, as a cleansing of all that is unclean and a making way for the Holy Spirit. And it's something you can fall back on over and over again, right? It is. And it's interesting because Satan tries to rob us of our baptism and what that means to us. And it's the same thing what he does with the forgiveness of sins, how he tries to rob us of our forgiveness when we re do receive absolution. So he plays those same type of tricks. You know, because we're in the kingdom of God, and we've been put into the kingdom through our baptism. And that's something that God does, and that's something that Satan can undo. He can undo your baptism, mm -hmm. you know. And so that is uh, a thing that we can turn to during those times. That's important, too, and might be sort of the, a question to leave us with. Uh, it's a question I get a lot, actually, with when I, I work with kids, is how do I know I'm safe from demon possession? Mm. So demon possession uh, can't happen like, say, if you're just walking down the street and you sprain your ankle. You know, so it isn't like we're, we can just walk down the street and all of a sudden, bam, we're demon possessed. You know, there has to be a way that you open yourself up to that. And that mm -hmm. usually tends to happen like through the occult. And so when you go seeking spirits, when you go seeking to, to look at these different things and to participate into that, then you open yourself up for them coming in. And so a really good story of this example would be um, the real story behind the movie The Exorcist from the 1970s. And so in the, the Hollywood movie, it was a little girl that got possessed. But in real life, it actually was a Lutheran boy who got possessed. And mm -hmm. His aunt, who he was close to, was a spiritist. And so she practiced trying to communicate with the dead. And so there are no such thing as ghosts. Ghosts are nothing but demons in disguise. But you do have a whole section of people out there who do believe that you can communicate with departed spirits, which the Bible totally forbids. So she was communicating with spirits, and she died. And so he got a hold of her Ouija board, and he tried to contact her. And what ended up happening was is he ended up getting possessed through trying to contact her. And then from there, um, it proceeds where he was had his Lutheran pastor come, and the pastor unfortunately approached it from a parapsychology point of view. So rather than approaching it as a pastor with God's word and sacraments, he approached it more like, I'm going to observe this phenomenon, and then I'm going to, to try to answer it like from a materialistic, natural point of view. And so at first, the pastor thought the little boy was conning his mom and grandma, like he was just putting one over on them. And so he had the little boy come and spend the night at his house. And so he wanted to observe him. Well, when the boy was there, then there was different phenomenon that happened. And then the pastor's like, no, this is actually real. And he's like, you got to take this to the Roman Catholics. They deal with this. So when I, when I first read that story, I'm like, time out. Like, why are we outsourcing this? We don't need to outsource this to the <laughs> Roman Catholics. This. 
You know, it's just like we have the gospel. We mm-hmm. have God's word. We have prayer. Like, there's no need to do that. But then eventually that that's what happened. And then the boy was taken to St. Louis. And then um, he went under many exorcisms. And eventually he was free. And then he never had a problem for the rest of his life. He was totally delivered mm-hmm. from it. And supposedly he went on to become a NASA engineer. So it's it's pretty interesting. So all that to say, though, is don't go into the occult. Be careful of, like, paranormal investigators because, like, ghost hunters and that type of stuff is very popular. And so what those guys are doing is they are playing with demonic spirits. And then they use mediums to, to talk with quote unquote, human spirits, which they're do- doing something that the Lord totally forbids them to do, is not to contact the dead through mediums or anything like that. So a lot of people um, can get into problems through that type of stuff. So the best thing to do is stay away from it. Stay away from Wicca or any type of magic that is out there. There's no such thing as white and black magic. It's all the same. It all comes from the the evil one. And so stay away from that stuff. And and also too, you know, like when people study the end times, sometimes they go like totally crazy on the end times where they're totally consumed with everything about the end times. And people can do that with this topic too, where they just go totally off into the demonic realm, trying to study and learn everything about it, where what they end up doing is they end up losing what Christ gives us. And then their focus becomes mostly on Satan and his demons and how they're going to fight him in spiritual warfare, rather than Jesus and the gifts that he gives to us in the divine service. And so it's like, keep your focus on Jesus and then let Satan be. Pastor Trombley, thanks so much for hanging out today with us in the drive school. Really appreciate you taking the time. Hey, no problem, brother. Have a great day. You too.